55 Slate Team. What's up, y'all? Real quick, if you like the DeFi State content on Twitter and YouTube and Substack, please, please give us a like and a subscribe on this video on YouTube. Join our channel, join the community. We'd really appreciate it. We're pumping this stuff out for y'all as much as we can, and we really enjoy the support and the community that we've built. Thank you very much and enjoy. What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode 51 of the DeFi by Design podcast here today to discuss all things privacy in DeFi. So if you've been using DeFi the last few months, few years, you know that on Ethereum, everything is public and everybody can see basically what you're doing if they get the slightest hint at one of your wallets. Um, you know, then we have a few, a few protocols now like Tornado Cash that offer kind of a, um, a streamlined privacy service, um, but we're really looking to get into DeFi um, privacy in, 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 in this conversation. So some of the things that I'd like to go over are, you know, and for us to learn and for you guys to hear is what can we do now to, to be more private with our Ethereum addresses in, in, in DeFi? How can we kind of keep our, our funds, our movements to ourselves? You know, kind of what can we do now? What secret network is, is building out as well to kind of help enable that for us and overall how, how we can create a more privacy, private and um, you know still open still a transparent ledger but a more private marketplace you know kind of that of a, a savings account that you have that you know you know your uncle can't go and find if he has your Ethereum address so I'm curious to learn more about uh, how we can stay private with the current technology today and then how secret network is also going to bring in some more privacy tools so uh, turn it over to Robbie and um, yeah the markets are mooning <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, September 3rd. Everything's looking green. Um, and yeah, I'm stoked to be here uh, talking with Tor and uh, getting into secret network. I'm not too sure about kind of the inner workings, but ultimately everyone wants a level of privacy to, to certain transactions. Um, so there, there's demand for a private um, DeFi, really. And uh, I'm, I'm keen to learn how this works. Um, and, and kind of like Andy said, you know, there's, there's these routes and these uh, different blockchains um, that are now being built by some secret tech, secret uh, technology. So I'll pass it over to Tor for a quick intro and uh, kind of let him get into it. And uh, yeah, what's going on, man? What's going on, guys? It's good to be here. Uh, I'm Tor. I'm the founder of an entity called Secret Foundation. We're one of the many, many organizations that support Secret Network. Secret Network, as we're talking about, is a private by default blockchain. It's not what you think of when you think of privacy and blockchain usually. Usually people are thinking of Monero or Zcash and private transactions, but it's not a privacy coin. Secret is a, is a privacy platform. And everything operates in the network with encrypted state, encrypted inputs, encrypted outputs, which gives developers and users a ton of control via viewing keys and other functionalities on what's private, what's public, to whom and when. Uh, so we'll definitely get into like the importance of privacy, but we should still keep in mind the importance of transparency as well. Like Web3, one of the best parts of it is its auditability, is its decentralization. So our view is not to create you know, the black box of, of DeFi where nothing gets in, nothing gets out. What it is, is to reestablish control in the hands of the users. Whereas in public by default DeFi, it's usually miners extracting value from the chain or it's the biggest whales in the world, like splashing around, running over like the minnows and the whales themselves want to protect their own privacy. So just having privacy inherent in these systems is a great way to benefit the small users and the big users simultaneously. So we, we do believe it's the future of not only DeFi, but all of Web3 to go private by default. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast um, between these, the concept of transparency and privacy in, in DeFi. Um, you know, one of the biggest marketing for Ethereum and blockchain is, you know, this open transparent ledger. Um, but now, you know, a year or two into building and using DeFi protocols, you know, we're starting to see that, oh, okay, well, maybe we do want a little bit of privacy in our, in our uh, you know, transactions. Yeah, I would hope that people started to see it. I mean, it's just a weird world because if you look at the way things work in the real world, like you said, your uncle doesn't log into your bank account all the time and forget your uncle, like your Uber driver or your neighbor or a stranger, 
everybody who has the public address who can associate it with you and with nfts pretty much everybody's docs everybody can see what you're doing with any address on the chain and that wasn't like a design decision to say this is how commerce should be i think most of commerce historically has been based on some understanding of access control and privacy i want to exchange something of value to somebody else but only to that person in return they will give me something of value but only to me in fact all of public private key cryptography is based on the idea that a private key is what entitles you to access and ownership of these assets. And yet, people grew super comfortable in Web3 early on just because this was the initial design of blockchain, that everything was going to be public to everyone by default. And I don't find that to be a particularly sustainable model, but it's certainly a model that can attract trillions in value into the ecosystem and already has. So I, I'm not going to sit here and say without privacy, this can't grow, because it certainly can. But can it be sustainable? And can the right people win? Can it really be democratized? Can we build the applications that really should exist instead of just, you know, whale games? I think you need privacy for that. And I think that's the next phase of Web3 and for DeFi. Yeah, the the openness of fi finances isn't really something that fits into the culture that uh, yeah, kind of as it exists now, that, that was kind of a new concept of commerce. Um, so fitting it more into how things work, making the, the transition from fiat to crypto easier, um, is, is, you know, it is changing culture is going to be, going to be something difficult. So if we can fit into what is already pre-existing, then, um, it'll be easier to adapt and less friction. So what on the UX side is really different kind of what are, is it just the addresses that are obfuscated? And, you know, is there uh, other aspects of privacy? Could you, could you just give us an idea of that? Yeah, for sure. So Ethereum is an L1 chain, right? It's its own layer one. It has some layer twos. Then Solana is a layer one chain. Near is an L1 chain. All, all of these, like, there's plenty of layer one chains, but they're all public by default. So you get very similar user experiences on all these chains. There's a public block explorer. You go in there, you're going to be able to see every single token balance. You're going to see the entire transaction history, all of that public to everybody by default. With secret network, things work a little bit differently. And this is by design. Because of the private by default mechanism, there's some aspects of the chain that are public by default, which is the native coin. So if you send secret around the network, secret itself as the gas of the network, those interactions are public on chain. But if you're interacting with applications and contracts on the chain, those interactions are encrypted and only viewable by the person who is controlling that address that's interacting with that contract. So to make this an analogy that's helpful in the Ethereum world, ETH has ERC20s. In the secret universe, we call them SNP20s. So they are effectively the same sort of thing, a token contract, deployed on secret network as opposed to a token contract deployed on Ethereum. On Ethereum, you go to Etherscan, anybody's wallet, you go, you look it up. Oh, here's all the ERC-20 balances. Here's every single transaction they've done with that token to every other address for the rest of time, right? Most addresses are interacting with contracts. Well, I don't want to say most addresses, but if you're doing something interesting with Ethereum, you're not just sending ETH to a friend, you're interacting with applications. So on secret, you would open up a block explorer you'll see somebody sending secret around the network. You'll see them staking secret, voting on governance proposals, things that are designed to be transparent. But when they interact with a smart contract, you'll only see that they executed that contract. So you can see that a token contract might've been interacted with, but you can't see if what value was sent by that token to what other address. That's encrypted, viewable only to the user. Or if you wanna go and look at their interaction with uh, an AMM built on secret network, for example, you'll see that they interacted with the AMM at that address, but you're not going to see on the block explorer the exact nature of that trade. Right? So right. this so this has some really interesting consequences. Gotcha. So you, you wouldn't see the price or the amounts um, uh, on like an AMM swap. Uh, and And that gets into some That are over on on some of these other uh, dexes, mainnets, and, and and other networks, um, mm -hmm. right? The concept of front running, back running, and right. and kind of just like beating someone to the punch when you can see the trade that they're making, you can up the gas price, you can get in, you know, and and make that trade beforehand. Yep. 
So this is a, th I, I definitely want to talk about that if that's where we're going. Uh, well, I'm curious <laughs> kind of on your, I guess on, on your position on that, because in one sense, if you can, it is a market inefficiency, right? To, yeah. to, if it can be a trade that's, I guess, taken quicker, um, so, so, someone ex can exploit that, that spread. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's kind of arriving at a, a more efficient price discovery, but at the same time, you're, I mean, it's kind of unethical. It's kind of just cucked for the other person that thinks they're going to make this trade at a certain price and then they're not because they got beat. Yeah. From an ethical perspective, I, I mean, I, I got my start in my career working as an options market maker and we were a high frequency firm and there's plenty of discussions about like front running is like pretty explicitly illegal in the real world. The, what, what they define as front running where crypto is kind of getting away with it is, what we call front running doesn't necessarily adhere to the traditional definition of front running, just like the way that exchanges are built in crypto don't look like traditional exchanges. Traditional exchanges don't work like AMMs. They don't have pools. They don't have LP rewards. They have, you know, order bit order book based DEXs. That's the, that's, that's like the equivalent in the real world is an order book. So when well, I think about, well, I'm go ahead. Just to add, just to add to that real quick, there, there is the, I think the parallel that we can see is I don't, when, Wall Street became more high frequency. They moved all those server farms to New Jersey, like like way closer to New York. Right. I forget the exact location, but just so that they could, you know, have their servers closer to the executing station. And it was just, you yeah. know, the electricity going along the wires, the wires were shorter. So yeah. we're we're seeing some something similar, like with um, I guess the the proximity that someone has to a node, someone has right. to like the actually executing this um transaction they can just send in their order quicker similar to shortening right. their wires um or, or you know, like bring their servers closer to wall street right so yeah. no yeah. that's that it's a it's a good analogy the the one place where i think it's it's a bit weird is because of the intent of the system wall street was never intended to empower main street right and the narrative of wall street has never been these high frequency trading firms and Goldman exist to enable the common consumer. That's certainly not the perception. It's certainly not the marketing and it's, you know, it's certainly not the reality. The reality is it's a bunch of pirates, you know, trying to capture as much money out of the system as they possibly can. Web three was supposed to be a decentralized, more democratic financial system for, for everyone, right? That, that was, you know, I say web three, cause that's what I prefer to call the space a lot of the time, but it's a, it's sort of a weird phrase to use because, you know, you could also just go back to the inception of Bitcoin and it's baked right into the Bitcoin blockchain. The whole point was to create a better, more democratic, more universal alternative to the banking system, which was failing. So when I look at where things are going in the crypto space now and I'm like, oh yeah, it's just like the banking system. That's a bug, not a feature. We don't want it to be more like that. We don't want to be really drives more efficient or sustainable price discovery. We have tons of boom bust cycles uh, in the crypto space as it stands. It's not like we've reached stable markets to any stretch. I think a lot of this stuff is actually exacerbated by MEV, by minor extractable value. So to take it back to like how to secret kind of approach this and think about this, because contracts on our network have encrypted state and because the way that it works is if a node in the network is processing an interaction with the contract, that is not viewable even to the node itself. So there's no way for the node to go and front run that transaction in an AMM. They literally don't see it. It's encrypted from the node itself inside the uh, trusted enclave. So when we talk about building those kinds of applications on secret, we say that they're front running resistant by design, by default. You don't have to have a lot of what's being designed in ETH to get around the front running or MEV problem are things that I think are actually just going to lead right back into massive centralization. And eventually ETH is going to be, you know, suffering from even worse centralization issues than it already has. Every blockchain, to some extent, secret included, suffers from some form of centralization issue, especially in its early stages. But when the entire blockchain is designed public by default, and there's sort of this gold rush to be, as you say, instead of closer to Wall Street servers, but closer to the miners and all the friendly to regulators to say nobody in the network can even. that we can support. 
So I, what, one thing I try to do with education around privacy and DeFi is to say, people take this assumption that like privacy and DeFi is going to not be friendly to regulators because Monero has been unfriendly to regulators or, or whatever else. Transactional privacy has this idea of being used for illicit purposes. But how the financial system actually runs, the applications that are being used for decentralized finance, if they don't have privacy protections, you're exposing the PII of all of your users. You're exposing their entire transactional history, like exposing a bank account to everybody. You're doing things that in the real world would get you fined billions of dollars. And then you're front running them. Like I, I see it completely the other way, that without these programmable privacy protections, we're not going to have a sustainable DeFi ecosystem that can interact with the real world. And eventually people are going to catch up to that way of thinking about it, but only after they've stopped thinking about things from that negative light. Just because that's the way that the, the media has often covered it in the past doesn't mean it's anything close to reality. There's, yeah, there's two pieces in there. It sounded like centralization and regulation um, were kind of the, the two um, just pain points of, of Ethereum, Mainnet, and these other public uh, chains kind of opposed to, to secret. Um, yeah, and it's an interesting one on regulation because the, they want something that they can, uh, these regulating agencies want something that they can control or I, I guess have transparency into. So it almost, do, do you see them allowing this kind of, and you know, who knows where this regulation is gonna, when and, and how it's gonna come in, but the, the path forward is kind of, we're seeing institutions deploy on these public chains. Um, do you see them kind of shoot, filling out their own enterprise blockchains almost? Like they're, they're like a, secret side chain um or kind of how do you anticipate um onboarding into secret and and kind of fill out what that looks like yeah i i think when we talk about interacting with any of these permissionless blockchains i always say permissionless versus permissioned instead of public versus private because that gets real confusing especially the way that i talk about private blockchains so we're describing Ethereum and Secret are both permissionless chains. Anybody can interact with the contracts, anybody can run a node, et cetera. But there's ways with Secret Network, for example, you could set up an environment on Secret where you still need to be a known entity with a known address. There's whitelisted addresses that are required to interact with a certain Secret contract that's deployed on the network. So let's say there's 10 banks, they each have an address, each of these addresses is whitelisted to interact with this dark pool trading contract. So when these banks each interact with that contract, they can't see what the other banks are all doing, but they know because these are whitelisted addresses that these are trusted parties in the context of that application. You can build and deploy an application like that on Secret Network. You can have that level of control because there is some publicity at the address and at the contract level when you, when you want it. It's all programmable. The idea is that it doesn't have to be all private or all public. You have choices along the gray of the spectrum that actually makes these things usable because a bank will want to know that they're interacting with trusted parties, but they won't want to reveal their activities with them. They don't trust them, you know, to not front run them or take the other side of their trade in a way that would be disadvantageous to them. Everybody has their trade secrets, right? In the real world on secret network, you can maintain them, but you can still know that you're interacting with trusted parties. That said, you could also deploy an application, a smart contract on secret, that didn't have a whitelisting capability that was open to all. And then it's up to whoever's using that application if they enjoy that trust model, right? But the platform shouldn't make that distinction. The platform should allow, like Secret Network itself should allow you to deploy any type of programmably private application. Then it's up to the users and developers to figure out how to use that functionality to build things that can be used in the real world and that can be compliant and that can support trillions in liquidity. That, that's our goal but it doesn't start from telling people explicitly at the beginning, here's a bunch of stuff you can't do. And with public by default blockchains, actually right off the bat, you eliminate probably 99% of use cases for Web3 because they require all information to be public. And that's, I can't think of any real world application where we would accept that 100% of the data used in that application had to be public to all parties at all times. It, it just couldn't exist. Right, yeah, the important info for certain things like, you know, in the example that we're using as far as front running goes, it's, you know, it's, it's almost, it's, there's pros and cons to it to having a fully open ledger for, for, 
for all sorts of financial transactions, right? There's less fraud, but then as, you, as, as we're explaining, there's more just ways for parties to get in there and manipulate and kind of do what, what they please based off the public nature. So, um, you know, in, in different industries like identity or in, um, you know, in land titles, real estate stuff, like, you know, having an yeah. open ledger to see every single transaction that's verified on chain. Like you can go on Zillow right now and see all the all the sales of, of homes, but to have it on blockchain would be pretty would be pretty spectacular because you you have it as fully open and verifiable. Then of course, but you go on but business. you go on zero, but when you go on Zillow and you see that price history, that's awesome. You can see the price history. What you don't yeah. see is the social security numbers of all of the buyers and sellers. Right, and the point is that Z- Zillow has they a, used yeah. to buy the house and their bank account yeah. and all that. Yeah, and where they used to live. That's 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 really the whole that's point, and that's why yeah. I'm saying like tr- transparency is hugely important. And I started the conversation yeah. by saying we have to have it, and it's one of the best things about Web three. But if it comes at the cost of everything needing to be transparent, that's the flaw of a public by default system. You, so if you it, can I go ahead, go, go ahead. I, I was going to get into like one of these applications and, and drive an ex- a specific example. Sounds like decentralized identity, but f- mm. you know, flush out that thought, and then maybe we can un- unpack a, a bit. All right. You want me to talk about decentralized identity? Well, if that is something. Because that's a rabbit hole. That, well, yeah, that's an application of blockchain that I think a lot of people have thought of and, and there hasn't been an implementation that's worked. Is yeah. Secret, the network to do that, is it somewhere else, you know, just kind of what? It's, a, yeah. it's absolutely go, go a secret. It. I mean, I think secret's the network to do everything, but you're asking a very biased individual. I think you know that, so that's cool. As long as I tell you that everything I say comes back to like really believing in this tech and like the fundamental thesis, like we're passionate about what we think it's gonna enable. So the question to ask maybe is, why haven't we seen a successful decentralized identity project on the blockchain? So what it comes down to for any successful application identity or not right there's two there's two main components one is product market fit right it needs to be right place right time right individuals uh and but then the rest just comes down to the the technology sort of matching up with the technological evolution of the space and what was what it was capable of there's applications on eth right now in 2021 that were going to be completely impossible in 2017 but we all thought of it there were like I've when I was building in this space in 2017. I mean, there was plenty of conversations about data marketplaces and like DEXs beyond Ether Delta and all these things. And only now, with like the layer two solutions coming out and all of these bridges and some of the zero knowledge years ago, even possible from a technical perspective. So one answer to the question is just, we didn't have the building blocks, right? Secret wasn't on mainnet in 2017, so we didn't have these privacy capabilities. There's obvious, I, I shouldn't say obviously, but there's a, there is a very clear link between identity and privacy. And identity is something that's inherent to you yourself, and you want to reveal certain parts of your identity to some parties and not others. You want to be able to prove something about your own existence, but you want to prove only that piece of it. Like if I want to prove, if you think about it, like the way that identity should work on blockchain is if I've got COVID, right? And I need, or if I don't have COVID, either way, I want to prove it. But at the same time, I don't also want to tell you uh, where I grew up, uh, my social security. Like you need to know enough about me to make sure that I'm interacting with whatever you want me to do in the right way. So a lot of these vaccine passports and things like that that were talked about, people were like, let's put them on the blockchain. What a great solution. That would be such a catastrophically awful solution. The, the only worst solution is probably what they ended up doing, which was putting it all in centralized applications that were completely insecure, uh, which is also bad. Uh, both of those are really bad, but for the same reasons, which is that they're privacy and surveillance nightmares. So I don't think that there's, a, there's been any solutions to date for the reasons that we didn't have the privacy tech to support it. I also don't think that people from the product market fit side of this, I don't think people really needed or wanted to to use it in web3 there weren't things that were interesting enough to use for like years that you would care to like develop a robust identity solution beyond using an anonymous eth address and like spinning up a new one it, it there wasn't just that much adoption or attention as of 2021 uh there absolutely is and now we're realizing oh crap we're behind one of the examples that i would use is OpenSea. so OpenSea, i've known them since they started building OpenSea. 
and they were building when nobody cared about NFTs and when people did care for a little bit and like with crypto kitties and stuff like building a secondary market for crypto kitties so niche and then a couple years during the crypto winter still building still nobody caring about NFTs keeps building keeps building suddenly right as everybody cares about NFTs there's been this platform there all along that they were building like because they anticipated that need well into the future and suddenly when the NFT tech and demand and product market fit could support it with the JPEG rush uh, OpenSea was there and that's how something can grow to doing like 4 billion in volume in a month and dominating like 95% of all secondary market sales for NFTs. So if now we realize that there's this huge need on identity, which we do, chances are there's a team that I don't know that's been building in the ETH space for years that's going to try to nail this and they're going to be right place, right time, just like those guys. I would encourage them to look into how they could use Secret for a part of that access control stuff, uh, which is going to be inherent to any privacy or any identity solution, uh, because we would love to integrate with that. We don't need to be the whole solution. You don't need to have identity only based on a single blockchain, but for the part where you're going to need to protect identity and still have it be decentralized for the things that do require that element of access control and data privacy, Secret should be absolutely that pillar. And we'd love to be that pillar for any identity application for Web3. And we would hope that any identity application built in Web3 is cross-chain, not only ETH native, because then it unlocks access to every ecosystem and all of that liquidity and all of that creativity. Yeah, yeah, I just froze out there for a sec. But um, yeah, on that on that note of integrations, how how do we how are we looking now with Ethereum based privacy solutions? So, what is available now for our listeners who are looking for some privacy on chain? You know, just a quick rundown, perhaps, of some of the available solutions, what they offer, um, you know, and kind of how Secret could integrate eventually with with some of these or with the Ethereum chain. So first, you know, what's going on on chain right now for users to use um, to in enhance their own privacy? Sure. I mean, again, like let's let there's transactional privacy and then there's programmable computational privacy, right? Transactional privacy is usually what people are thinking of when they yeah. think of like ETH privacy. So there people are always thinking about mixers, right? Like tornado, something like that. They just want to be able to like take their funds in, take their funds out, pay a little bit of gas and it's clean on the other side. I like all of this is just, I, I'm just describing it. These are not applications that I actively use on ETH. I'm very much like focused within the secret ecosystem, but I'm very, I'm very conscious of those kinds of solutions uh, in the ETH space. Then there's all the innovation that's happening in it at layer two like and all of these like layer two to lay what layer one transfers and roll-ups like there's ways to take things over to other layers do trades on those layers come back to the settlement chain of ethereum there's those types of solutions as well which are more for scalability than for privacy but they they certainly exist and are getting some attention um you know i i'm not sold on the product market fit of purely like transactional privacy solutions in the ethereum space and i actually think that you know a lot of them are going to attract the wrong kind of attention potentially um, what I would love to see is privacy and solutions in ETH that somehow work like they do on secret, right? Like a privacy solution that can protect against front running. You, you might be able to build that into your exchange, right? You have some sort of zero knowledge capabilities in a single exchange on Ethereum that would have that functionality. Yeah. Have you heard of, um, Eden? It was, um, yeah, they launched as, um, something else and then they're now Eden network. And they are an MEV protector that is integrated with SushiSwap. So they have their own oh. AMM as, as well. And basically it's private AMM trading on SushiSwap through their, through their integration. Yeah, that's cool. I see them. That was Archer. Got Archer it. was what it was. They have ArcherSwap. Yeah, so basically SushiSwap integrated ArcherSwap's liquidity. And so you can use ArcherSwap yeah. now as, as sort of a private AMM with, with, with basically no front running. Or MEV. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's fa it's fascinating how they've been able to like get that stuff together and market it. I, I still think like all these solutions were just in like nascent stages of understanding how they're going to work. One of the concerns that I have about building, so there was actually a lot of conversation about like the phrase "privacy is a feature, not a product," and I, I think Multicoin wrote an entire blog post about this concept where I completely disagreed with the title, but agreed of a lot of the context. It was, it was a very good blog post. I just thought the title was completely backwards. 
So the issue that I have sometimes with a lot of this is like, if you build your privacy solutions directly into a single application, that's always going to have like siloed liquidity, you need that specific product to be very successful. And this same privacy mechanism might not generalize to other products that you're supposed to be composable with. But if it only works for Sushi and not Uni, for example, right? Remains to be seen, like the, the if, if privacy was really the sort of feature that you could add as a differentiator and build a moat around, then right. in theory, now, now this would capture all of the liquidity in the ETH ecosystem. But realistically, liquidity actually revolves around, uh, you know, liquidity. <laughs> And liquidity and yield yeah. liquidity and... begets liquidity and yield right. especially exactly so that that and then front running is kind of like a nice to have but on secret yeah. network like front running resistance is something that every single application gets by default so rather than right. having applications in our ecosystem say ah we are the only front running resistant exchange any exchange you build on secret any lending platform all of these DeFi applications are already going to have front running resistance by design because of the functionality at the protocol level but they're going to retain all of their composability. All these applications on secret are still composable. So that's, that's what retains like decentralization on secret network that everybody's utilizing secret tokens the same way on secret network. All these different AMMs are all going to be able to interact with each other. You can easily move tokens from pool to pool. All these interactions are you know, private, privacy first and then they are front running resistant by design. To me, that's a more sustainable and a much more interesting and differentiated model than having a race where now it's like, okay, now every product on ETH has integrated their own exclusive front running solution. And the yeah. trade off is that it's more expensive. And the trade off is that it becomes a little bit more centralized. And that's always and the trade off on ETH. Potentially, yeah. And less liquid right. as a result because like the liquidity is less transferable between pools. Or you constantly yeah. have to go on to layer two and off to achieve some of these solutions. Like putting the whole network private by default. That, that's the thesis that's always been the differentiator. If you make only a single application like that in your network, I, I don't think that that application is necessarily going to succeed. But if you build one private application in a private universe, you're, you're going to have a very good chance of success because you're interacting with a bunch of applications that are equally private. So you don't lose all those benefits of privacy every time you leave that application. You keep it everywhere you go in the network. So if everybody has yeah. that same ethos in the product, to me, that seems very sustainable. Now, at the time that Multicoin wrote that blog post, you know, this didn't exist as an ecosystem. So maybe it would have been right to say at the time, yeah, privacy will never be a differentiated feature. But privacy by default can absolutely be a, a differentiated feature for a blockchain. And you can build an entirely amazing ecosystem probably on that differentiator alone from DeFi to NFTs and beyond. We haven't even talked about how this touches NFTs, but it's, it's such an amazing time to be experimenting with that design space because I think finally, like we were saying, there's interesting shit to do on every network. So it's, it's worth yeah. playing with new kinds of solutions that can't be built anywhere else. Right. And we're seeing how compo go ahead. Andy. We're seeing the, the main use case on Ethereum, as you're saying, just the transactional privacy is basically mm -hmm. like wild, wild west avoiding regulations and using tornado cash to hide your funds basically. It is like the main use case on Ethereum right now. Like that's it. Like we're in the wild, wild west. Some people might be doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Who knows what the what the SEC is going to rule DeFi as? So use Tornado Cash to you know do whatever you need to do to do what you, you need to do. Whereas yeah, on a fully private network, I mean everything is just right. As you're saying, it's it's these 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 applications. I mean that application would even work on Secret because well, I mean why you don't even need it. Same thing with kind of with the Archer Swap and Eden concept because it's already integrated and built in. Um, so I think for full, like, as, as you're saying, public by default chains, some of those applications will work in, in, in their specific niches. But for the most part, users that are really looking for that privacy will just simply go to ones that are, uh, you know, private and public by default, kind of like ZK Snarks S chain. Yeah. So that's an interesting. Mixers are thing. dangerous. Mixers are dangerous. They, 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 are, they are definitely a target. I think ZK Snarks might be that middleware between like a public and a, and private, which I'm almost hesitating to use public versus private, right? And uh, permission versus permissionless. So, what I, I'm my question is how how composable do you see Secret Network with other EVM chains? Um, right. At all of the all of the applications on Secret Network are aligned with private privacy in mind. But yeah. you know the the on and off ramp there. How, how 
open is that? And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good question because as we see a lot of activity is currently happening on EVM chains. So, uh, but not all. And I actually, you know, we've always taken a multi-chain view. So we build bridges where we can. The reason we launched as a layer one chain in the Cosmos Tendermint universe is because of their focus on interoperability. So for listeners who aren't as familiar with non-ETH universes, there's two main like interoperability focused non-ETH universes. There's Polkadot and there's Cosmos Tendermint chains. Polkadot has very much like a hub and spoke model where like Polkadot is the hub and all of these parachains sort of orbit around it. Cosmos has a much more sovereign model where every blockchain can sort of define its own identity. So chains under this model include uh, Cosmos Hub itself, but also Terra and Secret, of course, and Akash. Um, Thorchain uses some of this as well. They, and they all are building with this idea of interoperability and they all share the same sort of fundamental structure so that when new modules are being designed for these chains, we can all integrate them. So one of these modules is IBC. IBC is the big hype Cosmos uh, module that's being integrated uh, sort of universally across their ecosystem right now. The hub added it, a bunch of the component Cosmos chains have already added it. Some of the more complex ones like Terra and Secret have been working for months to try to integrate it. I think Terra is happening this month. Our IBC integration is finally going on mainnet in October. So that's a huge step towards interoperability with other Tendermint chains initially. But what that also means is that any of those Cosmos hubs, any of any of these different Tendermint chains and hubs that connect to each other, if there's one that is also connected back to Ethereum, we can all benefit from that Ethereum bridge. We already have a bridge that goes directly to Ethereum so people can move assets back and forth. But with the evolution of IBC, the idea is that you're going to be able to do uh, cross-chain contract calls. So if you need to do some sort of like private game logic, for example, you can run the private game logic on secret and be making those contract calls to secret from another chain and settle back to that chain. And you trust secret because of the value that it's currently protecting and because of the size of its own ecosystem. But the lines are gonna start getting really blurred between all of these chains, EVM or otherwise. We use uh, smart contracts that are written in Rust. So the, it's, it's Cosm Wasm based, which is like the universal Wasm uh, standard across the Cosmos ecosystem. Again, Cosmos uses it. enclaves and what that allows us to do is work very closely with these other teams to teach developers there's a lot of advantages to developing for you know in cosm wasm versus evm chains but obviously evm dominates on the development side we don't want to see one ecosystem win or another ecosystem win we just want people to keep building really powerful technologies that are also secure we think most most of the cool security properties you gain via you know secrets model and web assembly and everything else like that makes it really advantageous to focus on that but we're not going to sit there and say we don't want to interact with EVM chains because that would be stupid to throw away all of that incredible developer adoption and user activity. So we're, we're focused on bridges to make sure we can access these universes. Um, but we, we are very passionate about developing our own ecosystem because our own ecosystem isn't a silo. Our, our own ecosystem is always going to be extremely interconnected with the rest of the Tendermint universe. And then any chain that integrates IBC beyond that, which, which any chain really can do, it doesn't have to be um, something like secret network to be able to interact with IBC chains. So very excited to see this technology get more widely adopted across the entire web three ecosystem. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Rust cross chain uh, contract calls are just ridiculous. So I'm, I'm uh, you're cooking, I'm cooking over there on Cosmos. We're, we're cooking, man. We want, we want to cook. Everybody wants to cook, man. I mean, ETH never slows down either. There's, there's no substitute for the, for the creativity and the originality of the ETH ecosystem. I'm, I'm so envious of everything that happens within the Ethereum universe. And I try to be a part of it as much as I can because man, like NFTs, like that's, that's yeah. really cool. It's be becoming its own culture on, uh, on Maynard oh, yeah. and just ETH. Yeah. And NFTs are one thing you mentioned, just all the different applications. And once you don't have just, like you said, imagine what is unlocked uh in terms of nfts once you, you don't have them on public uh blockchain yeah, yeah. i mean so like your can't like your camera roll something <laughs> I don't know. well the thing about a non-fungible token is that there's always been a link between privacy and fungibility if an asset is private it can retain its fungibility but as soon as you can identify it distinctly as soon as you can say this bitcoin has this provenance 
it's kind of not really fungible anymore. You know exactly where it came from. If you know that it came from Silk Road, that's not a yeah, fungible Bitcoin anymore. That it's was, always the Silk Road Bitcoin. That was an issue with, with yeah, like blacklisting tokens and, and would you want, um, which is still a potential issue, right? Where China kicked out a bunch of miners and they were talking about Chinese Bitcoin, like Bitcoin coming from yeah. miners in China being just just flagged. Um, so right. yeah, uh, that that leads to issues. Definitely. Do we think that, so that so having that, privacy for NFTs, like non fungible tokens, wouldn't that make wouldn't that kind of defeat the purpose? Ah, so that now, now you're asking a very interesting question. No, it would not, because what the reason you want privacy for NFTs is because you want the control to be in the hand of the users. You don't want privacy in that it's private forever, so you can never show it off, or it's private forever, so like you can't do anything with them. The idea would be, let me give you an example. Like if you wanted to use a privacy preserving NFT and kind of have it as like a cookie, for example, but you don't want other people to know that you have it. Like somebody issues you a nft they send it to your address it'll it won't be visible on chain that you were sent this particular nft to this address and if it's a non-transferable nft as well now it just sits in your address but if you ever need to prove that your address contains it you interact with another contract to prove you hold this token and now you basically got this private cookie access to whatever experience you want and you can interact directly with that token that you hold but you don't have to reveal to anybody else that you hold it whereas on eth the whole point on ETH is that once you have an NFT in a certain address, you're completely doxxed. If it's a rare NFT, especially, and people know that you, like they can assign it back to a real world identity and they see that NFT sitting in a wallet, like ETH doesn't work this way. If I, if I know you've got a hundred ETH, I know you're rich, but I don't know why. If you've got like the specific board ape that I know belongs to Jay-Z or whomever, and it's sitting in a public like address, now we always know who that is and you're burned forever. Like you could never, and you can't even get the NFTs out. What do you do? You send them to a new address? Cool, we know it was yours, right? There's no like mixer for NFTs. The whole point is that they're non-fungible. So I actually believe the future of NFTs, their provenance is gonna become even more important and you're gonna want to issue them on private by default blockchains because on a private by default blockchain, you can always choose to make them public. You can always choose to say, stick your hand up, I've got this thing in my address, let everybody know, show it off, like it's your Rolex or your Lamborghini or whatever else. But if you don't want to show it off, if you want to quietly sweep every NFT floor, put it in a private wallet, and then eventually have an access controlled gallery where only certain people in the network are allowed to view it, that's really cool. Doing this stuff on ETH without you know, re-centralizing everything in AWS is practically impossible. Not, not just expensive, like actually impossible. But on secret, our aim is to make it even easier. So as bullish as I am for privacy and DeFi, privacy for NFTs and what that means for culture and access, I'm like, I'm a hundred times more passionate about and I'm, I'm psyched for what we've got coming in Q4. Yeah, there's potential there for uh, metaverse museums. Yes, right? for sure. Like, pri pr like private art galleries, you charge like a couple bucks mm -hmm. to come and view the art. Yeah, you can rent it and then you just regenerate a viewing key and you revoke access. You know, yeah. it's, it's going to be real interesting. All that kind of that kind of programmability is what we're seeking to enable. And in ETH, you're going to have to think of the world's hackiest solutions for like commit reveal strategies or whatever to try to get something like that done. But in the in the secret metaverse, I'm I'm actually like extremely excited. The other idea that we have because we're talking about composability between chains we're thinking a lot about how to use ETH NFTs and link them to secret NFTs like one-to-one -one, so that if you prove that you've got an Ethereum, let's say you acquire an Ethereum based NFT on OpenSea and then there's some sort of bridging mechanism where you lock it on ETH so it unlocks a, a minted NFT on secret network. And so the really cool thing about NFTs on secret network is that they can have private metadata. The way that regular NFTs work it's all public metadata. Everybody can see everything about your punk. Everybody can see everything about your ape or whatever else. But with secret, you can have a bunch of public metadata saying, here's the public stats. Then you've got private metadata, things that are only viewable to you because you're the owner of the NFT. You've just unlocked all of this information about it. You can also embed private metadata that isn't even viewable by the owner, right? So you to the punk owner themselves unless they do an unwrap function and explicitly unwrap it otherwise you've got a punk with a secret attribute that you can get like you can sell it to somebody else and like maybe it's rare 
maybe it's not. There's all these other like elements of gamification you can try and use. So I should stop rambling about it because if you let me, I'll take yeah. another hour. But it's it's just uh, I'm hyped for that design space because if you can link it back to ETH, back to Solana, any of these other universes where all this NFT experimentation is going on, then you know the sky's the limit. Yeah, it's very exciting. The NFT space is yeah, it's going nuts right now. It's been, it's been fun to watch, man. It's been fun, but uh, yeah, Tor, we, we appreciate you coming on, man. We're about running low on time, but you know, we just have one quick question for you that, that we ask everybody at the end, which is um, if you had to pitch the secret network in an elevator, uh, who would you pitch it to and why? Oh, cool question. Yeah, it's a lot easier if you're pitching a single application, I imagine, because you know, it, it, like I honestly, God, who would I pitch it to? The entire blockchain network. I, I, I would probably used to say somebody in finance, but now I got to pick somebody in culture, right? Somebody that I know would get this, somebody who understands the idea of secrecy, the importance of privacy, like somebody who's got their own secrets. Uh, at, at one point in my more foolish years, I might've said John McAfee, because I know he'd get it right away. And that would just be a fun conversation, but probably a terrible idea. Um, I, I don't know. I don't I'm know, thinking man. Edward Snowden. Snowden would also be an amazing choice. I actually, I, I tried to uh, reach out to him a couple of times because he did some NFT work on, on uh, Ethereum. I'd love to see him do some NFTs on Secret and embed some of his own work within a Secret NFT as private metadata. You know, I think that would be cool. He'd probably appreciate that. Have you been um, in touch with so you, Fluffy Pony? Yeah, uh, yeah, he's going through, I've met him a number of times, yeah. for sure. Yeah, we have a bridge to Monero. Uh, so that, that went live on mainnet last month. So we're, we're getting more integrated with some of these privacy by default, transactional privacy ecosystems. He, he'd be an interesting person, uh, to, to continue to have conversations with. But I think if I had to pick the one person in an elevator, I think actually you came up with it for me. I think Snowden's perfect. I, I really think that would be, a, that would be a really interesting opportunity because he's, he's seen it all. And, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by somebody with that level of courage. Yeah, he would get it, you know? I think he'd get it right away. I don't, I, and the best part is there's no expectation he's going to jump and now show it to a hundred thousand followers or whatever else. Like, I just want to talk to him about it. Like I, I like talking to people who I don't think they're going to have a vested interest to be a shill, but they actually think I could use this for my own work. I could use this for my own purposes. I think my other answer would be Banksy. Nice. I'd like to pitch secret network to Banksy. That would be a lot of fun, nice. but I don't well, think any, maybe I already have, and I just don't know it. Right. Exactly. Banksy, <laughs> if you're listening to this, coming on. Hit me up, guys. Oh, All right. Well, thank you guys for having me on. It was a blast of a conversation. You you guys seem pretty passionate about this stuff. So I'm excited to see what you guys cook up next, too. Thanks for coming on, mate. It's been a pleasure.